Joining us today on Superheroes of Science, we have Dr. Emily Hall. Emily is a staff scientist and a program manager with MOAT, where she is involved with both the ocean, ocean acidification program and the chemical and physical ecology program. So thank you so much for joining us, Emily, and welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. You know, I think the easiest and uh, what makes the most sense to start with, uh, I know we have like thousands of questions for you, but uh, I think we'll probably cut some of those short if you explain what those two programs are. Oh, sure. And, and probably what MOAT is, or maybe what MOAT is, then those two, I don't know. <laughs> One something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll start off with it. So MOAT is it's short for MOAT Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. So we have um, basically three different entities within our MOAT family. We have our research side, which is where I work. And then we have our education side. So we have a lot of education programs, um, a lot like what you guys are doing and working on. And then we also have our aquarium side, which is where we try to show off some of the cool research and education programs that we have going on um, through our aquarium. Uh, and then, so within the research side of MOAT, I, I, like you said, I run the ocean acidification and the chemical and physical ecology programs, which are a mouthful. Um, <laughs> ocean acidification is uh, basically related to climate change, studying the effects of uh, changing pH uh, on our ocean. So uh, looking at the chemistry, ocean chemistry on different organisms and different ecosystems within the ocean and our coastal environments. And then in chemical and physical ecology, same kind of thing. We're looking at changing chemistry, but more related to typical water quality parameters like nutrients and, and chlorophyll and, and other other issues affecting our coastal and marine environment. So it kind of all ties in together. Um, yeah, so. it, it sounds like it's just a bunch of chemistry stuff. It is a bunch of chemistry, but we tie it into the biology and the ecology because uh, you can't have that biology without that chemistry. So it's yeah, true. I love that. <laughs> it's a, um, can we start with um, the ocean acidification? Sure. What so, about it? <laughs> uh, what about it? <laughs> uh, I mean, it, simply uh, when we talk about the pH, talking about the our percent hydrogen, the amount of uh, or how acidic or basic something is, mm -hmm. and your by the way you said that, I I am taking it that the ocean is becoming more acidic? Mm -hmm. you're, you're correct. Um, so ocean acidification is often considered the evil twin of climate change or the other carbon dioxide problem. And it has to do with the amount of carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere, um, but not just the amount, the rate that we're putting in the atmosphere. So just like human population is growing exponentially, meaning we're you know, growing more and more faster, faster every year, um, we're also putting more and more CO2 into the atmosphere faster and faster. One of the great things about our ocean is that it it absorbs some of that carbon dioxide, which is great because it because CO2 is a greenhouse gas, it contributes to global warming. Um, so um, nature likes to maintain a balance is a good way to look at it. And so our ocean absorbs about 30% of that carbon dioxide. Wow. Because of the rate that we're putting it in the atmosphere and the amount that we're putting in the atmosphere, that ocean's having to work double time, triple time, maybe even to absorb, to maintain that 30% absorption. And so we're starting to shift the chemistry of our ocean, at least the carbonate chemistry, which is actually really, it, it can be difficult to do, but we are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean, the ocean is so big. Yep. It, yeah, it is huge. So it, um, ocean acidification is a global problem. It's not it's not just here in the United States. It's not just in Indiana or Ohio or New York or Florida. It's 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 all over. It's Europe. It's Asia. It's it's North America. It's South America. We are all contributing to our carbon dioxide emissions, mostly through the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and we're, we're still continuing to do that. And, and ever since pre-industrial times, like so ever since we started burning things for energy, uh, we've started to see this shift. And, and there are a few models out there um, that some really well-known and, and really, really smart scientists have put together for our future, like 50 years from now, 100 years from now, predicting 
where we may be. Um, and a lot of it is based on human behavior. So how we decide to get energy, how we decide to change our lifestyles or not. And globally, that's actually, that's really difficult to do. It's hard to get everyone in the world to agree to <laughs> do something together. And we're starting to see some of the repercussions of that. So, Well, can um, I ask really quick here? I know a couple of episodes ago, we had talked to someone about this. I believe we were speaking with a, with a NASA scientist who does some research with atmosphere. And mm -hmm. was he was speaking about how um, with the shutdown kind of this spring, I mean, everybody's shutting down and it's like all at once we have this opportunity for a really neat experiment to see, okay, all at once, it's, it's all like overnight almost, everyone has kind of stopped all these commutes and and there's and it's kind of like it's interesting to kind of watch what's happening with some of these emissions are you be looking at oceans and things is there like a similarity with i know like that was the atmospheric side but the ocean side would would we be able to potentially see anything coming from the spring i mean everyone kind of stopping yeah um i, I hope so it'll take some time to to really look through a lot of that data um especially on a global scale um mm -hmm. but uh, also, I don't know if the shutdown was long enough. Um, there is always a lag time with kind of what we're doing with our beha human behavior and burning and, 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 you know, whatever we're doing on land mm -hmm. and into the atmosphere and, you know, to the ocean. It, there is a lag time. And the question would be, was it a long enough stop, I guess, before we would see some of those changes? And um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I, I do know there are some scientists trying to look at that. So so hopefully we'll we'll get an idea maybe within the next year or so uh, as to see if there were any changes. Um, and there may be there may have been changes like locally in, in people's right. local backyards, like local estuaries or local coastal environments. Mm -hmm. um, but but I don't know. I, I really hope so, because it would be a great like like the NASA scientists said, you know, it'd be a great experiment, a great, a great study to see if indeed that that helped. But we've also started opening everything back up and going back right. to our normal right. behavior. So yeah. right. <laughs> hard well, I appreciate that because, yeah, it, it's it is, a, I would think, time dependent. So, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in, a, in scale, too, it, as you mentioned, you might see some differences in a local area. But when you talk about the ocean, it's such a large scale. It takes a lot longer for to impact that. And as you said, it's will say impressive uh, that humans can actually change the city of, of the ocean right. and so it's so that happens over time and it, it takes a long time to impact and so it would take a long time to reverse that mm -hmm. or even see a, a divot i'm guessing in the data yeah. but, but i don't want to be negative I, I mean we can do it for sure we can do it it just we have to be persistent <laughs> how do you monitor this Oh, ocean acidification specifically. Mm -hmm. um, so we look at a number of different parameters. You, you definitely have to monitor temperature and salinity, for example. Um, but then there are there are four measurable parameters in the carbonate system that, that, that ocean acidification scientists can look at. So you can study what's uh, things called total alkalinity. And then you can look at the partial pressure of CO2. So PCO2 is what we call it in short. You can look at dissolved inorganic carbon, and then you can look at um, pH. And so as long as you measure two out of those four, so actually go out and take samples or have probes that are out there measuring those things, then you can calculate the rest of the carbonate system uh, to tell you what is what is happening immediately in, in, in whatever body of water that you're looking at. So, there are scientists all over the world that are studying ocean acidification and they're looking at it in their, like, again, their local regions, but then also building models to try to see what some of those changes will be as a whole global event. Okay. And what are some of the apparent impacts of the increase in acidity? Um, yeah. Right. So here's where we're tying that chemistry to that biology for sure. And one of the, the big things and one of the things that I look at with colleagues here at Moat, because um, we also have a lab down in the Florida Keys where we study effects on, on our coral reef, um, our, our main big reef in the continental United States. Um, one of the things we know is that ocean acidification can start to dissolve the skeletons of those corals. Uh, it also can dissolve shells of calcifying, other calcifying organisms like 
other bivalves like clams and oysters, for example, which could ultimately have a big impact on our economy um, as well. Also food sources, people who depend on, on seafood and, and local uh, environments for tourism, like especially in the Keys. Um, and so this dissolution of those, those shells and skeletons, um, we also know that it can affect other behavioral uh, uh, and physiological aspects of corals and other organisms too. So things like photosynthesis and respiration. Um, and so the, uh, there's a lot we don't know too. Like there are definitely a lot of things that haven't been studied yet. There, it, it's a continuous process trying to understand we're also trying to look at ecosystems as a whole. For example, are we having net dissolution of a coral reef right now, or are we seeing net accretion? Um, and I have some colleagues that are looking at that in the Florida Keys, because uh, that'll have an impact. So going to the Florida Keys again, for, as an example, if a big hurricane comes through, which we are now in hurricane season, so we are watching that, um, those reefs, uh, provide a service to the land there, like they actually help buffer against some of the storms, our barrier reefs and reefs like that. But if they're dissolving, then they may not serve that function anymore. And so um, that can be worrisome in the future as well. <laughs> so. Wow. All right. So I, I, you're involved in so many things. It's hard for me to narrow down what to ask you. <laughs> because I'm like, oh, I want to keep asking about this. But I'm like, but not wait. But you're also... Uh, in charge of another program there besides the, the ocean acidification. Yep. It, it's in what was that program? Chemical and physical ecology. And so, yes. what exactly is chemical and physical ecology when we say something like that? When we're talking about an ecology, what what is that? So, we are looking at, I guess a, a good way to say it is we're looking at different chemical patterns uh, within our local regional areas, uh, how they relate to those environments, how they impact the biology or the ecology of that, of that environment, and mostly looking at water quality issues. Um, a lot of areas are very concerned about nutrients, for example. Um, part of my job with that, and it's a whole nother topic that we could go on a tangent on, but I, I work in our Red Tide program. So I try to help understand how uh, some of these nutrient patterns are related to red tide. So when we get big red tide blooms, and also when red tide blooms are not here, you know, is it, are those, where are those nutrients coming from? Are they helping maintain these blooms? Um, we also do a lot of work with seagrass and, and uh, nutrients and seagrass in our local estuaries here. So many things. <laughs> well, for so for maybe students that aren't that have never heard of red tide or that don't live near the can what is red tide? Sure. Um, well, at least red tide, the red tide that I study, we, we can call it Florida red tide. It's a harmful algal bloom that um, that can form these massive blooms along the coast. So in the Gulf of Mexico, along the Florida coast, the um, the west coast of Florida, especially. Uh, nearly annually, we see blooms of red tide. And it really, like, if you looked at it from a satellite or even from an airplane or a helicopter, you would see what, it's not actually red, it looks more brownish here, but it, you would see this darkening color in the water. And that, that's basically millions of cells of this, this phytoplankton, this, this algae, that's, that's harmful to both humans and the environment. And it's harmful because it has a toxin in it. And so when that cell breaks up or, you know, gets splashed through the waves and stuff, um, it, it has a, a neurotoxin, which we call here, it's a brevitoxin. Um, and that toxin uh, can cause things like neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. Uh, it can also be aerosolized, meaning it can get into the air. And if you breathe it, it can cause you to start coughing and, and gasping for air a little bit. It's not going to choke you, but it's really problematic for people, let's say, who have like asthma. So if you have, if you have asthma, it could maybe trigger an asthma attack. And so, um, you know, there are problems with that. And then as far as the neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, when we have a red tide bloom, anything that filters out the seawater, so like uh, clams and oysters, mm -hmm. they actually bioaccumulate that toxin. And then if I was to eat that clam and oyster, which we do love our clams and oysters here in the state of Florida and, and you know, and all over the US for right. sure, um, uh, if it has that toxin in it and you eat it, you could get neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, which actually can make you very, very, very sick. So, um, you know, it's, it's worse than just a typical food poisoning type. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there are issues with that. Um, 
And, and to kind of go off a little bit more talking about these two programs that I run, we're now starting to look at effects of climate change and ocean acidification on these harmful algal blooms to see if there's any connection. Do they keep these harmful algal blooms around? Are they gonna wipe them out? We don't know yet. So um, everything, everything we study brings on more and more questions, but that's yeah. part of being a scientist is you get to keep asking questions and you know that curiosity and where is this gonna take you next? I love how you said that. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to say that's perfect. And that fits into what a lot of teachers are starting to discuss right now. Yeah. Beginning of the year, as soon as they start in, they're going to discuss kind of like what is science, the nature of science. And so it's great. Or you can talk about that's bringing in more questions. Then we come up with more questions. And, <laughs> and it, so it's that's perfect. And how you said that, the all, I, well, what I, I guess to paraphrase that the more that you learn, the more questions that you have. It's not necessarily the more, you know, the more answers, so you're done. Right, yeah, you're never done. <laughs> but it's cool. I mean, and if you end, if you find that you have a passion for science, if you have a passion for asking questions and, and exploration, you know, like, what's out here? What does this mean? What is this doing? And I have an idea about this. Science and engineering, especially, um, it's, it's such a great field to take, to go into because you can, you can feed that curiosity and you can, you can, you learn tools to how to answer these questions or how to study them and stuff. And, and you meet other cool people who are just as excited about that kind of, that kind of stuff. And it, it's, a, it's, even if we're studying things that are negative, you know, like ocean acidification is, it's not a feel good science all the time <laughs> because you're learning like, oh gosh, you know, this is going to hurt this and this is going to hurt this. But then you start to look for things like, well, maybe how could we fix this? How could we um, alleviate some of those those negative things that are happening? So you also start to come up with new ideas. And um, I don't know. It's just it's sorry. I'm going off on a tangent, but oh, it's, it's, really, it's definitely a great way to 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 look at you know to fix that curiosity or to, to approach it. So, yeah. Oh, I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, all right, so. I know I want to ask which one the blue because I saw the blue holes. Is, I know I want to go there, but before I go there, I want there's one more um, I, because I, I guess I would like to know. Um, and I guess I did a little research, so I know a little bit more about that on uh, because I did look up your profile and stuff to see who the heck we were interviewing. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, so you want to do a little bit of checking before you ask. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so what um, for a career path? Mm -hmm. What is important for a student if, if, if a student is listening to this and they're like, oh, I want to be like her, you know, <laughs> can I, is your office next to you available? You know, I, I want to go there. I want to research this. Um, what would you emphasize would be a good choice for them to um, concentrate on or make sure they're really looking at to get to where you are? Yeah. Oh, gosh, that's a tough one, because I, I think I followed a rather unusual path to get to where I am today. Um, but we work with a lot of, well, one great step, especially for students is here at Moat, we work closely with a lot of interns. We have huge intern programs here and a number of different ones, You know, some that are geared towards high school students, some that are geared towards uh, college students and even graduate students. So um, we have a whole, a whole spread of, of what we can offer for students. And we're not the only institution that does that. A lot of institutions do that. And in fact, I started as an intern here at Mo, And so it's, you know, I've come full circle. Um, so like definitely first and foremost, just go out and about and talk to people and talk to like, like find your local, like if it's marine science, even go to, if there's a local aquarium, or, or local uh, colleges where people are doing kind of marine science, especially if, if that's what you're interested in. If, it, if it's botany, go to those people, you know, go to a, go to a nursery, go to, you know, the, those different types of, of, of areas and, um, and talk to people and, and start to get a feel for what they do. Even if it's just an hour out of one day and you sit and do an interview with people, it's really good to hear all the different experiences because um, nobody, I don't think anybody got to where they are the exact same way that other people got to where yeah. they are. Um, so like I mentioned, um, 
I, I did an internship here at Moat. Uh, I actually went to college mostly to play soccer. <laughs> so um, I knew I knew I wanted to do a, something in the sciences, but I wasn't sure what. But I had also grown up going out on the boats all the time and being on the water all the time. And it wasn't until I took a course in, in, in undergrad that was it was an environmental science class. And um, you know, and I was doing kind of a basic biology, chemistry, basic sciences. So when you first start in college, you have to, you know, you should take your basic chem, your basic biology, if you want to go in a science field, um, just to get those out of the way. <laughs> um, but I took an elective, I took an environmental science class, and uh, we were outside all the time for the class. We, and we were doing all different things. Sometimes we were in the water, sometimes we were in the forest measuring tree trunks, sometimes we were, you know, hiking through some sand flats or something. Um, and I realized that, oh my gosh, I love this. I love being outside. I love, and I'm, and I love being in nature. You know, I love doing that kind of stuff. So I spoke with that professor and, you know, there was a, a degree there that I could major in that, that would keep me in that path and those, those courses. And, I did that. And then um, and then for grad school again, because I had played soccer in undergrad, that was my <laughs> priority. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but an opportunity came up to um, go to grad school in environmental engineering sciences. Um, I'm not an engineer, but I was in an engineering program and and I took it and I just somehow found my way, you know, I started to take classes and I started to kind of narrow down what I liked. And I realized, okay, I really like the water. I want to do something on the water. And then I was like, okay, am I a chemist or am I a biologist? I had taken a bunch, you know, I had kind of majored in environmental science and I yeah. didn't know which way to go. And um, so I really liked the overlap of using, you know, understanding chemistry to understand the biology. So that's kind of how, why I overlap so much in what I do now. And um, followed that path and ended up, you know, doing an internship and talking to people and got a job at Moat. And I've been at Moat for gosh, 15 years now. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Yeah, I so. like that. I mean, I like it. the two big things is just try different things to mm -hmm. you like and to reach out and get, talk to those people. And so and I think those are two things that kids are scared to do. They're like, oh, I have to know exactly what I need to do and I need to figure that out now. It's like, no, go into what you think you might enjoy and experiment and find out and your path will lead you where you need to be. Yeah, well, exactly. And I love that, too, that you you had that question, you know, am I a biologist? Am I a chemist? And that ultimately it doesn't really matter that that it all sort of overlaps together and that you're still asking the questions and doing the science that you're interested in. But you're using all of those. And I, I've seen students, I think, get kind of hung up on, you know, well, this is biology class or this is math class or you know this is social studies let's say and and so i shouldn't be graphing if i'm not in math class and, and i think that that kind of applies to what you're saying that it's all it all supports a lot of the same questions you might be asking for all of those yeah it's totally okay to like and it's totally okay to go into let's say a biology major in college and and you're gonna have to take chemistry and there's a reason they're making you take chemistry um and it's okay to hate that chemistry too but, <laughs> it's good to at least experience it and try to understand it and get a taste of it. Um, Cause you never know, you may end up loving it without <laughs> realizing, without even knowing it, or you may end up finding a, um, a program down the road that is like biogeochemistry where you're kind of mixing a lot of it and stuff. And so, um, you know, and, 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 you know, there are people out there who do know exactly what they want to do. I have a colleague who works in corals and she knew she wanted to work with corals ever since she was a little kid. And, um, and that's a great way to do it too. If, if, if that's who you are and you know, um, that definitely just wasn't me, <laughs> so, but it's okay. Cause I still got to a really cool place. Um, not knowing. And then, you know, uh, I would say it sounds super cool. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. And the one thing, the one thing I wanted to talk to you about that I haven't even got to, I'm sorry, um, uh, because I told you this, that's what we talk about. Uh, because um, the 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 where, what program does the blue holes fit under? Okay. The, um, so blue you know, holes. That's the one thing I was going to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the way I got into doing blue hole stuff was initially through the ocean acidification program. Oh. Um, and the reason being because a colleague of mine at Moat who 
um, he's kind of one of the, the first scientists to go out and really look at these holes. So, you know, he's, he's been at Moat for 40 years and, and has been exploring these holes, mostly on his own time, just with his, his cave diving buddies. Um, he one day took an instrument with him. He literally strapped it to his scuba tank and it was a, uh, an instrument that measures conductivity, salinity, temperature, pH and dissolved oxygen. Cause he just right. wanted to see like, okay, I'm diving in these holes. Why don't I just get some data while I'm in there? And that's an easy way to do it. Um, and he found that when you get to the hole and as you go down into it, the pH starts to drop and it drops pretty dramatically. And so he approached me because that's one of the things I study and said, hey, look at these profiles of, of these holes. It's really neat. And I was like, oh my God, yes, I have to study this. Also, I love diving, so let's do it. <laughs> And so we got a, um, together, we got a small grant back in 2012, I mean, a very small grant, because in research, you do typically have to get grants in order to be able to do the research, because it's not free. <laughs> like taking a boat out, it, it, you do have to pay for it, even, even at your own institution. So um, <clears throat> we got a small grant to start looking at a couple of holes, and, and we found that these other two, a little bit shallower holes, uh, had these these features. Um, and so we started looking at, we started taking samples to do more analyses. So we also started looking at nutrients, which ties in my other program. <laughs> um, and we saw that nutrients were elevated in the holes as well. So we've got pH dropping, nutrients going up, but then we have this huge, this really dynamic, diverse ecosystem around these holes. And so what the heck is going on here? You know, what, what's, what's causing these animals to love this place? Um, and so in 2018, um, we received, we applied for and received a grant from NOAA um, to, it's a NOAA ocean exploration grant to really characterize a couple of these holes in, in, in big detail using some technology. So now we're tying in biology, chemistry, ocean technology, uh, microbial ecology, radio chemistry, radio isotope chemistry. Uh, you know, we're working with a number of institutions to really try to characterize these holes and understand what's going on. Wow. <laughs> why blue? Why, why blue? Is that what you asked? Why are they blue? Well, so it's a little bit of a misnomer. So if like if someone was to go online right now and do a search for blue holes, they're prob the, the big thing that's going to come up is probably the blue hole in Belize, or there's another blue hole in China that are, um, you can, they're visible from the air. Like if you're again, flying a helicopter above, you can see, you can actually see this, this big hole. And it, it, it is just the color. It's very blue. It's, it's a very like oceanic blue. Cause it's, it's very clear and, um, really, really nice and very, really enticing. Like it definitely makes you want to go. It looks, it looks like a big spring. Um, the holes that we're studying, are further offshore. So they're about 20 miles or further offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can't see them from the air because they're so deep. The holes themselves, um, of the two holes that we're studying for this project, um, Amberjack Hole doesn't open up until 115 feet below the surface of the, the ocean. And Green Banana doesn't open up until 150. So it's 150 feet below the surface of the ocean. And so they're not, so if you're on a boat looking down, you can't see the hole. Uh -huh. You don't really see it until you scuba dive down to the hole and then all of a sudden this hole opens up in the ocean floor so it's it's slightly different um and they aren't always blue when we see them like with all these nutrients sometimes we see big chlorophyll blooms which actually makes it look green <laughs> but 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 they've just been called blue holes um for a while now so <laughs> So what we're with. Well, let me ask just to back up what so you said it's a hole in the ocean floor mm -hmm. if it's and if that's the case what causes it or, or do you are you studying what causes it um so we believe so they're actually on the florida shelf so eight to maybe twelve thousand years ago uh the florida shelf uh, the sea level was lower our, our land mass in florida so florida was much wider than it is today, than what we know it today. So that that part of the land was actually out of the water. Um, and so, um, and I guess trying to, a, a good way to describe it is, so if you ever go to the state of Florida, which I highly recommend everybody go do it, it's crazy, but there's some really cool environmental ecological systems there. 
Um, and one of the things we're known for are our springs and sinkholes. Um, and so on land here, we have a lot of springs, which again, very blue, very clear water. It's, it's typically fresh water here. Um, and that's a place where people can go and swim, use for recreation. It's like a big swimming pool, uh, but it's, a, it's like nature's swimming pool. Um, a lot of people go cave diving in them. Uh, same with some of our sinkholes, like uh, uh, an underground cave perhaps could collapse and then fill up with some of our groundwater. So we have a very, what we call karst ecosystem here. Uh, our karst, I guess, geology is a better way to say it. Um, meaning we have, our, our land base is a lot of limestone. So limestone is uh, with our groundwater system and with, with the nature that limestone is, as water moves through it, it can start to dissolve out, you know, just like ocean acidification, dissolving that, that calcium carbonate. It can dissolve out like caves, caverns, springs, sinkholes, that kind of thing. And so we think, you know, 8,000 to 10,000 or 12,000 years ago, that's what happened with these, these springs and sinkholes. Um, but how, now, since then, they are now underwater, under the ocean, because of the way the land has shifted and moved and the sea level has risen. Um, but they're so far offshore and they're so deep that they haven't been filled in um, by sediment because of, um, or, you know, or like from hurricanes and stuff, whereas holes maybe closer to shore can get filled in by moving, shift, shifting mm -hmm. sediment. But these haven't. So these are still those springs and sinkholes that are that are out there. Does that make sense? Yeah. To... yeah. Especially being from Indiana, because <laughs> yes. we have a very karst topography in southern Indiana. Okay. There are a lot of sinkholes and caves because of the, um, the when the rainwater comes through mm -hmm. the soil and becomes acidic and it eats away our limestone. Okay. So same and, kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, very cool. And I think that's what attracted me to it when I saw the article. It's like, I'm like, oh, it's like Indiana underwater. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm like, this is really cool. <laughs> Not to mention I'm reading like a really scary uh, novel about uh, Southern Indiana sinkholes. And so, <laughs> that kept me awake a few nights, scared me. Um, <laughs> But see, this is so cool. It's it, it's amazing to to actually think that you're going out there and diving down there with instrumentation yeah. to collect data to try to figure out more about like that ecosystem within one of these. Mm -hmm. and why you know what all's happening in that? That just is it's absolutely amazing to me. Yeah, it's it's super cool, and like I would love to describe so like a little bit what it's like like a day and like taking the boat out is that is that okay oh, yeah. <laughs> so so i'm only recently uh getting certified as a technical diver um so anyone who does cave diving for example has to be you really have to be technically a, a technical diver um to be able to do it because it's very dangerous you can't just be a recreational diver you could get trapped in those caves. You can get, um, you have to breathe the right mix of gases or be on a rebreather. Um, and so basic open water diving usually certifies you to go down to something like 60 feet and in open water, meaning no overhead cover, no, you know, you know, it's usually like coral reef diving. It's usually very, very easy, very gentle type diving. Um, but I am a scientific diver and uh, for, for these holes, um, because of how deep they are, you do have to get technically certified. So that's one one cool thing, and we can talk about like scuba diving and that aspect of it. But what's really cool is we get we take a boat ride, we go out to these holes. You're out in the middle of the ocean. You you can't you don't see land, so you're just on a rocking boat. Hopefully you don't get seasick, <laughs> or if you're like me, you do get seasick, but you, you take some medicine to to take care of it. Um, and then you, you get in the water and you dive down and you're really, you're kind of diving down into just ocean because you, it's just very blue. You don't know what's going to be around. Sometimes you have a remora sticking to you that you're like, ah, get away. <laughs> um, and, um, but then as you're going down, all of a sudden you see this hole open up. You see this kind of darkness, um, amid the blue and you get closer and closer. And then you see, all of a sudden you see schools of fish and you see sponges and you see corals and you see bivalves and I mean and the number of fish is amazing and we see sharks down there and we see um, goliath grouper that make this big womp sound when you get down there so you hear these like kind of booms and and then literally you're sitting on this hole just like 
well, what's down deeper? I kind of want to go in deeper. And, and so the tech guys that are, are, are able to go down to 300, 400 feet, they go down there. I'm not quite there yet. I sit at the rim and just wave as they go down. <laughs> but oh. you know, swimming around the rim is, is super cool uh, too. So it, it's a really, really neat experience. And, and it's really cool to be able to take video and stuff and bring that back to you know, home base here and be able to share that with, with you guys, with your students and, and with, with the community here, because not everybody can dive these things. It, it's, it's tricky for sure. Um, As you're describing this, I'm just thinking, gosh, you're probably one of the very few people who have ever actually seen or experienced this. This is that's yeah, awesome. yeah. There, there have been so before before myself and some of my science colleagues have done it. Um, I would say some of the only guys that have gone out to these holes to look at them really were my colleague Jim and and his his technical dive his dive buddies, and it's like it's cave divers and. Um, back when Jim probably really started getting into it in the 80s and 90s, um, there was a very small handful of, of like cave divers, technical divers, at least in the state of Florida, that could go do these things. Now, there are more now and people who are interested in it, but it's still really hard. I mean, to get 50 miles offshore and to be have your, you know, be suited to be able to go do these kind of dives. It's not a whole lot of people doing it. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting to be able to do it. Yeah. It's like you're exploring another world on our world. It, Absolutely. That yeah. is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. And, you know, and that's like the exploration side of the, the research and the science that I do is being able to just go and, and look at these things that, you know, face to face and, and, and just be able to describe them. And sometimes you do just sit there and you're just like, stop and look around and you're like, Oh my gosh, this is so cool. <laughs> so, wow. uh, yeah, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> oh, that is amazing. Emily, thank you so much for your time today and explaining these things. This is awesome. Yeah, no problem. I love it. I love sharing it. And and hopefully it's like lighting a fire under under students or or people even. And like if you have an interest or you have that that desire to go do things like this, you can do it. You know, I didn't become a technical certified diver until just this last year. And, you know, I'm, I'm well beyond my <laughs> K through 12 school years. So it's never too late. It's never too late to do this kind of stuff and to get into it. Um, so um, please do. And, and I'm loving this and loving all these questions. So this is great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Please hit the subscribe button so you'll continue to hear about new and exciting STEM related work being done. Tweet us questions, suggestions, and requests at Purdue SOS or email us at k12science at purdue.edu. Until next time, be super and remember, you are someone's hero. Boiler up! Hammer down!